You're listening to The Dental Guys. Treating airway without a diagnosis is the problem. What can surgery do that orthodontics cannot? Featuring Dr. Mike Gunson and Dr. Rebecca Bacow. The title says it all. This week on The Dental Guys. When The Dental Guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, Cavicide and cabbie wipes are the first things that come to our minds. It's automatic, and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry, and their products work. The Dental Guys trust Kerr products in our offices, and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters. One relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And if you're listening to this, you know, a few weeks after we record it, we're sure it's worse where you are than where we are in time because COVID continues. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it the Rona. You can call it the vid. You can call it the COVID-OV. I've heard lots of terms to describe <laughs> it, but... What's going on now is we are seeing this scary resurgence, obviously. Here we're recording this, you know, it's September-ish, August-ish. And every time you send me an email about COVID, Wes, it's like when I don't want to open because it's like the ne- the stats of the local university center, medical center, showing how many ICU beds occupied, how many inpatients, you know, praying that there's going to be vaccination. You know, my county currently, What's your percentage? this is embarrassing. Come on. 39%. I was going to say- 39% of the my county, county. I'm proud to say the county that I live in has the highest vaccination rate of any county in the state of Tennessee. We're at uh, 56%, which I believe is tracking pretty true with the United States. And uh, yeah. yeah, we're not going to talk about- But you got a county full of here. scientists and- you know, I mean, these are oh, yeah. these are people I mean, like, that, that I live in. Yeah, I live in Secret City, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and it's like right. You know, we are. Yeah, they they, they take it seriously. Their their science projects are like how to control global warming. You know, I mean, that's that's a sixth grade science project for these for these kids. I love it, but I I think you know, it's interesting to talk about this because, you know, a year. I, I mean, a year ago, or so, a little over a year ago, you know, on this podcast, we were like. We were out of work. We were, we were talking every day about what's coming next with COVID. And then we kind of felt like we got over the hump right around Christmas, New Year's, right? We got vaccinated. Yeah. It was rolling out. Looked like we had, you know, the stock market was going. It was great. It was, hey, we're going to get out of this. And now here we're seeing mass mandates returning. We're seeing hospitalizations. We're seeing ICU beds filling up. We're seeing people arguing about whether kids should wear masks in school and uh, and now I feel like, I mean, do you, what do you think, Wes? I mean, what, if, what do you think dentistry will be affected by this or not? Well, it already is, John. Today, even my schedule was affected in some way because uh, we had four hygiene patients fall off because they were contact traced because due to exposure. And right now, mm. if you haven't been vaccinated, right, um, you you really are supposed to quarantine if you have been vaccinated, though, right? You don't have yep. to quarantine. You just have to test at about three to five day mark and then test it again at 14 days. So, I mean, it's all about just getting the vaccination. You know, the interesting thing is, is that the vaccine works. We're not going to argue about it on this podcast because, well, we follow the science, right? The Dental Guys is about Geek's Corner and all that. So what do I think about it's going to affect dentistry? Yeah, it's going to affect us, right? Especially for those. Like I had one of my good friends call me tonight and he said that his hygienist who had COVID in February, who he has no idea about her vaccination status, has a 
live-in um, person that lives inside of her house that has COVID. And he was like, so what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, first you have to know if she's vaccinated or not. I said that turns Mm -hmm. that in turn will tell you whether she can come back to work or not. Otherwise you risk putting people at exposure, uh, being exposed. It's, it, it's fun to kind of sit here, not fun. I shouldn't say it's interesting to talk about like the difference between now and what we were seeing back in December, January, when we had the, the big giant spike in COVID cases. Uh, now, right, I feel like that we know how to take care of ourselves, right? We know what works. Yep. We know how to treat it. We're not seeing as many deaths, right, to COVID. But what we're seeing is, um, you know, probably about 85% of the people in the medical centers here in East Tennessee are unvaccinated. You know, there's about 15% breakthrough hospitalizations, breakthrough COVID. I know that my booster is coming at eight months uh, past Mm -hmm. uh, that date. I know that if you are immune compromised, you speak to your physician and he'll write write you a prescription letter to the pharmacist to get a booster 24 or 28 days, I think, past um, your third or second COVID uh, or Pfizer vaccine. Um, if you got um, the Johnson & Johnson, it has not been approved for booster yet, um, and Moderna is on its way for getting that approval for booster. Also know that if you have had COVID and then you've had one shot, right, of Pfizer or Moderna, mm-hmm. you're like solid. Like you're so solid right now mm-hmm. with antibodies because of the, the research that's coming out of like um, – France, I believe, and UK, even the United States, there was some good research in Israel. That, yep. in Israel that like, look, man, like you're rock solid, like good, you know, because yeah. you not only had right, ninety one percent of the yeah. protection level is still yeah. there. So, so we know it it's we know industry? that the booster yeah. is going to, yeah, it will, but it's different effects, right? It's different yeah. than it was. The first shutdown was PPE shortage, right? We knew that. And there was a question about transmission. Now we've kind of established, if you saw the JADA article, you know, recently that, yeah, there can be transmission, but it's extremely rare. What we're, what we're doing is working. So it's not so much a question of transmission. It's a question of patients, uh, last minute canceling because of contact tracing, last minute canceling because of a COVID positive, last minute canceling because they have to stay home. Yeah. They got to stay home and watch their kid who got contact traced. They have less online school now. A push is back toward face-to-face school. So, you know, it's just affecting our schedules a little bit differently. Not necessarily badly or good. It just depends on where you're at. Um, I mean, we're still super busy. But there's going to, I think, be more dropping. And the question is, too, if school gets canceled, which has been happening all over where we are, school's getting shut down for a week because the COVID cases are too high. And, you know, what happens then with parents? They've got to maybe stay home, provide for care. So then that starts to affect feeds back on our schedule. Will it get to where people are nervous? The interesting demographic thing I'm seeing is the most susceptible people are older patients, right? Who, who kind of didn't want to come in during the time there was no vaccine. Most of them, most of them, I think got vaccinated. So they're not as concerned. The younger invincible patients, quote unquote, who thought they're invincible are now ending up in the hospital because of COVID. Those are people who aren't going to cancel on you until, unless they get sick. So it's like this weird thing. The older patients are coming in. The younger patients are still on the schedule unless they get a COVID positive. So the question is, how many COVID positives will we get? How many contact traces will we get? Which schools will get shut down? It's more just a question of how do you schedule? you know. And so I think we need to be thinking a little bit differently. Maybe not right now. I mean, we're just seeing the beginning of this, I think. I, unfortunately, if you read what everybody's saying, it's not going to get better anytime yeah, so soon. So our peak and here so, at university, um, here in our town, our peak they're predicting is at about September the eighth. And so if you're listening to this right now, we're probably probably over that hump, um, and hopefully headed down. Mm-hmm. I think all this is supposed to be over a little bit before uh, Thanksgiving, just a time for me to be in the woods and uh, jump out from behind a tree and catch a deer. Um, and, uh, so there you bring go. that home. Let me just say this though, right? I'm excited about what's coming because man, there are so many things that are happening in my world that are so good 
right? I'm just going to spin this positive real quick here is that I've experienced yep. a tremendous amount of, of case acceptance. And what I've also done is I've been able to apply the education that I've received over the past five to six years to the nth degree. This has allowed me, even though I haven't traveled for CE in the last, say, 14 to 15 months, John, and John, we're going to travel big time next year. We just we just traveled yep. this weekend to actually do some training ourselves for other doctors. Super pumped about that with restorative driven implants. Yep. But what I'm excited about is what I've been able to actually do is to really dive in and apply these things that we're learning at our CE courses. Not not only are we learning how to do better dentistry, but we're learning how to be, do better diagnosis. And that's what this podcast episode is about. I think the problem that we're seeing is that airway has been this I, 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 it was, it's been marketed to dentists as something that is easy to treat and especially right. to, uh, maybe some of the, some of the docs that are just wanting to jump into this and make oral appliances. And I have no problem with oral appliance therapy. I do it in my office. And if you're doing any type of appliance, oral appliance therapy, you need to know something about airway. According to the American Academy of Prosthodontics, yep. you need to at least evaluate the airway before you even deliver a Michigan splint, which is a flat plane right. anterior, a flat plane splint. I mean, you could make this patient worse. But what we know is that yep. the diagnosis, John, of cranial facial problems, right? The skeletal development issues that people have been born with or genetically predisposed to or have been affected by some factor in growth and development really is throwing dentists for a loop. And either you're going to ignore it in your practice and just let it fly under the radar, which is cool, right? Because you could be that kind of a dentist that just wants to practice bread and butter dentistry. Or you could mm -hmm. be somebody that says, I'm pushing, right? I'm treating full arch. I'm treating, you know, higher level cases. Well, let me just tell you, you need to listen to this podcast, right? And you need to share it with your orthodontist. And you need to share it with your surgeons. And you need to share it with people that are passionate about, like, really going to the next level. Because I think that Dr. Gunson here, man, and Dr. Bacow, they haven't really cracked any codes per se, they're just right. doing what we've always known. And exactly. that's what I love about it, John. It's not yeah. it's not anything quote unquote special sauce, right? John, right. bring it but in. But it's just putting together what we know about skeletal development that's been around for a long, long time and, an and anthropology, really, that's yeah. been around for a long time. And then now applying that to how we develop skulls, how we develop airways, how we try to improve you know, influence those things. And if we ha can't influence them, you know, early that there are interventions late that can, you know, make huge differences yes. uh, to change not only people's, you know, look, but they're, they're really their life. And that sounds like just a, a trite little saying, but it's really true. I mean, it's their whole life that can be changed by this. So we're excited. I mean, these are the people that are the top of their game uh, with, with this in this world. And so we're very honored to have them with us. So after a quick word from our sponsor, we're going to bring you Dr. Michael Gunson. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Have you really examined the practice you're thinking about buying? I mean, really examined it inside and out. How are their business efficiencies? Do they have well-established workflows designed to maximize the efficiency of the business and client satisfaction? Or are they lackadaisical and inconsistent in their daily systems and operations? Before buying a fixer-upper, a practice that needs to be overhauled, consider the lost time and revenue that could come from fixing someone else's problems. For more information about this and other dental-related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And welcome back from that message from our sponsor, John. We've been waiting, right, to really take it to the next level 
from a standpoint of growth and development. And we talked a little bit about that um, on previous shows about what if we could bring together an orthodontist and an oral surgeon who specializes, the oral surgeon specializes in facial reconstruction. And just from a standpoint of the story behind our journey a little bit is that I remember John and I approaching Dr. Greg Kinzer back mm-hmm. at Spear Education maybe three or four years ago before Becca Bockow got involved um, at Spear. And I remember him saying, you know, I have somebody in mind in yeah. Seattle, right? Yeah. <laughs> that she's so busy. She's, she's got She's so kids. busy. She just We really want to get her involved. Right. <laughs> and we were like, we're, we need somebody. And we need somebody for our specialists to come out and listen yeah. to and learn some of these techniques. Like, he's showing these cases. Like, here's yeah. what Greg and we're And I raised my hand and I said, okay, who's doing this? Like, who is who is the who are these cases? Because he wasn't talking about the name. And he was almost didn't want to tell us. He's like, well, there's this lady and she's really good. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to really get her involved. And we asked him after the class. And, and then it was sort of the same thing on the orthognathic side. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, who's doing this well, who's doing this right. And is there a way to put that together into something that would kind of start to help teams understand what's possible mm-hmm. and what the limitations are. So how awesome is it? That now, after all, you know, these three or four years later, we've got Dr. Rebecca Bacow and Dr. Michael Gunson here with us on the show to talk about that very thing. And it's kind of a cool thing to get that full circle. And now, of course, they're involved teaching this and integrating this into spear curriculum as well as into uh, other uh, areas of teaching. So welcome, Dr. Bacow, Dr. Gunson. We're glad to have you guys. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, Becca, and, you're no you're no stranger to the podcast. Like you, this is not your first rodeo. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to actually give our new guest, Dr. Mike, the floor here. I just called you Dr. Mike, and I apologize for that. But <laughs> it's uh, fine. It doesn't matter. So, so Dr. Gunson, um, why don't you tell a little bit about where you're at, what you're doing right now, and what are you passionate about? I know that's going to lead into what Becca is passionate about, and I'll let uh, Becca kind of introduce herself again for those that might be a first-time listener here. So, Mike, why don't you take it from here? Sure. Yes. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and uh, I live in Santa Barbara, California. I've been in Santa Barbara for, for 18 years, and as long as I've been in Santa Barbara and, and in private practice, my practice has solely been concerned with uh, orthognathic surgery. So I only do jaw surgery. It's all I've ever done in private practice. And, um, and as such, I, you know, through the years, when you do orthognathic surgery, you, you have to be able to do the orthognathic surgery well, but then also you have to understand all the aspects that go into it. So I've learned a ton over the years about orthodontics, for example, about restorative dentistry, uh, and especially about uh, growth and development. Um, you have to, you know, you got to be able to explain to your patients why they need surgery and where all this came from. So you delve into growth and development. Uh, I've learned a ton about um, TMJ, condyles, um, learned a lot about airway through the years and how to, how to manage airway, how to be successful, what to watch out for when treating certain patients. Um, but as I've gone through all this uh, time uh, learning about these things and focusing on facial aesthetics especially, um, what I've come to understand is that the underlying aspect of facial aesthetics, airway, uh, bite, um, speech, all these other things, it, it boils down to function. It boils down to, um, I'm dealing with a face and how is that face supposed to work? And if the growth is incorrect, then that face doesn't work right. And then that's when patients have their problems. They start compensating, they start adapting, start developing pain, they start developing unesthetic changes to their face. And so what I'm passionate about is, is really uh, how function um, is affected by growth and development and then what we can do to improve those things. Uh, I love what I do. I get to 
you know, I get to an analyze all these different aspects uh, from speech to breathing to teeth and, you know, all the things that I've, I've been taught through the years to get to put it all together uh, with orthognathic surgery. It's kind of like the sum total of dentistry. And, and tell uh, us a little bit about um, how you ran into Becca Bacow. Um, I think it was at Spear. Um, I, I think the year that I was invited to speak at um, the faculty uh, meeting the in the summit. fall. Yeah, the summit meeting. Uh, Becca was there and I listened to Becca and it was like, oh my gosh. And I think I made a beeline to, to talk to her about her experiences. And, uh, you know, from there, we just, uh, anytime we get together, there's a lot. There's hours of talking. So, uh, you know, uh, reviewing uh, what we find in the literature, reviewing uh, patients and and uh, talking about growth and development. So it started there and um, we just uh, I mean, you know how it is. You find you find somebody that speaks your language and it's just uh, off to the races. So hey, also known as the dental guys, right? Wes and John. Right. Yeah, we have a right. similar problem with the hours. Yeah. So, Becca, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing right now. Well, I'll just echo what Mike said. I think my passion, so what I what we'll be talking about as, as the show goes on is what are some of the problems that patients come to us with and then how do we figure out how to get them, how, how do we solve the problems that they're presenting with? And so for a child, we can guide growth, but for a non-grower or for someone where we've maybe the, it, it's too far gone off off of the, the healthy path. We have to get the bones in the right place in order for the system to work properly. And so like Mike mentioned, uh, the aha moment for me is when he was talking about the importance of lips coming together. So it's all about the system, the tongue, the lips, the cheeks, the joints, the teeth. And we ultimately want the teeth centered in the bone and the teeth working as a system. And that's what we see as dentists, but there's so much more to it. And so when we think about rehabilitating a patient, if the bones aren't in the right place, I can't do a lot orthodontically and still talk to a patient about solving their problem. So sometimes solving the problem includes moving the bones, not just moving the teeth. Mm -hmm. Now you, Hence before the, the partnership show, for, yeah, yeah. And you, you talked about a little bit before the show as we were kind of prepping for this, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are becoming more aware, obviously, of um, airway and and how it affects dentistry. We we know that that's you know started from lots of different avenues. Uh, some uh, you know more science based and literature based, and some just more you know I read it in a uh, you know a, a throwaway advertising uh, journal, and there was a page there talking about how I can make appliances for all my patients, for instance. And so there's a lot of different ways people get into this world and. It sounds like um, there's, there's so many approaches to um, even what maybe the most seem like the most straightforward case when it comes to expansion versus surgery and, you know, how do we make these decisions? And one thing that uh, you guys were talking about was the idea of treatment solutions versus a diagnosis. You know, how do we identify what types of patients need what? And especially when it comes to surgery versus, say, just simply expansion, quote unquote, simply. Um what does that mean to you guys, you know, treatment solution versus diagnosis, you know, what, what's, uh, how does that factor into identifying the right patient and the, and the right type of treatment? Yeah, He's going to take, take that it. Line. Okay. I'll go. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'll go to my experience first and my experience is, you know, when somebody ends up in my office on referral or on self-referral, um, it's an interesting finding that I would say that uh, definitely way over 50% um, of the patients that come to my office for a consult for jaw surgery have had orthodontia uh, at least once, if not twice. Um, and so when you start seeing patterns where, uh, or, or the treatment times, for example, the treatment times of orthodontic treatment far exceed two years. They start going into four years, five years, six years. And so you start asking the question, well, why, 
you know, why is this happening? In fact, the parents are asking the question, you know, why did I spend the money and my child was in braces for six years and now I'm in your office and I need something else. And so I think that's, that's the difference between like treatment based uh, versus, you know, diagnosis based. Um, when the patient initially presents to the orthodontist, usually the question from the family is, is, well, can you fix my child? Can you fix it? You know, this problem. And the orthodontist uh, answer, you know, genuinely is yes, I, I can fix it. And then the problem really goes in, down to the, the key word, which is it, right? What what are they fixing exactly? What what's the promise here? And unfortunately, a lot of patients, um, the answer to that question is straight teeth, or even simply the bite fitting together, as opposed to um fixing it which is a global problem and without talking to the patient you don't know what it is you know this child might uh snore this child might uh, drool and breathe through his mouth all the time this um this child might not be able to get their lips together but the parents don't know what that means um the child might have this bizarre looking smile and the child gets scolded all the time in photographs because they won't smile correctly or the child um, has bad posture and gets yelled at day in and day out um, to stand up straight. When all of these things, you know, what the orthodontist is looking at again is I have tools to straighten teeth, so I'm going to put the bite together and straighten teeth, as opposed to delving into this entirety of, uh, you know, life experience and problems that they might be having. And in which case, if, if those diagnoses came up, then, uh, well, the, the presentation would be different. Then you're talking about, oh, well, we do have growth problems. So what kind of growth modification can we do to avoid surgery? Um, uh, those kinds of discussions as opposed to just focusing on the bite. And I think last time in our last podcast, Becca, we talked a, quite a bit about what was possible with uh, intervention right up to the age of what we can do this, but then then these tougher conversations start to happen. This this idea of what you just said is that I need the bone actually moved. And so when when do you start to identify that as a problem in your diagnosis as an orthodontist? I think it's different for every patient. I've seen seven, eight year olds that are already with they already have vertical maxillary excess. Uh, I can't, I can't change that gummy smile if they've had seven or eight years of mouth breathing S sometimes. So as an orthodontist, I'll try to identify the compensations that are occurring that are leading to the skeletal patterns that we see. For example, a very popular one that has been popping up in our practice the last few weeks is lower lip entrapment. So kids... Mm -hmm that walk around biting their lower lip. Well, of course they're gonna have overjet. Of course that mandible can't grow if they're constantly biting their lower lip. So trying to take away some of those compensations early, but certainly by the time the kids reach puberty, it's unpredictable to claim to grow a mandible. Um, maxillary growth, we can bring a maxilla forward a certain extent, uh, especially if we start younger, but as they get older, it's less predictable. And then vertical changes are not as predictable as well, especially in older kids. And so certainly by teenage years, maybe sooner, we're going to start to identify skeletal issues that we can't correct with growth modification. And then we start a conversation with the parents about this is probably going to need a surgical correction. And then similarly, when we have adults that come see us, if there's... now. I'm trained as a periodontist as well, so I want the teeth to fit together. I also want the teeth centered in the bone. And so you can't just move the teeth where there is no bone. I think some people try things and, and they move the teeth out of the bone, and that creates all, a whole host of problems, in, including bone loss, periodontal loss, supportive periodontal tissues. And so Sometimes the real answer really is moving the bones, not just moving the teeth. Yeah, if I could so I think we're, on. oh yeah, go ahead. I go just ahead. Wanted, 
No, I th what Becca said is terrific. And let me just be a little bit more. I know she's um, hesitant uh, in some <laughs> respects to, to talk about this. But um, so this whole expansion idea is fantastic. It's wonderful. There's a lot of attention being made into maxillary expansion. Um, but there are limitations. And Becca brought up some of them, which is, you know, basically bone. And um, and so people attempt to overcome the lack of, say, alveolar bone by doing things like uh, SFOT or Wilkodonics or whatever the, the newest acronym is for that procedure to allow the teeth to move into bone to, to bone, either bone graft or, or whatnot. And so the dilemma there is you got to watch out for periodontal structures, but then it's like, well, okay, let's, let's do dome, MSC, SARPI, MARPI, again, the whole smorgasbord of ac acronyms. But there we're talking about actually expanding the maxillary bone. So what are the limitations there? Well, um, limitations there are the buccinator muscle. You know, nobody ever really talks about the buccinator sling that, uh, except for a few people, uh, good friends of mine. Um, but, you know, the buccinator attaches to the lips and goes back to the airway. You want to talk about a connecting uh, muscle that nobody talks about that's intimately involved with airway and function. That's that buccinator muscle. And yet you, you have people who want to expand for the sake of expansion, and they're pushing these teeth and bones into the buccinator and the problems that that develops and causes in in lip function, facial function, breathing. So there are certain envelopes in the body that can't be breached. And so that's why diagnosis is so important. It's, it's like, okay, let's look at the teeth. All right. There's not a crossbite, so there's not a problem. Well, we know that's not true. You know, you take the CBCT scan, you look at the roots and the roots are plastered against the buccal cortex and the mandible. You've got uh, lingual dumping of the crowns and the mandible. Well, you've got compensations in the lower jaw um, for a narrow maxilla. So yeah, now you need to expand. And how are you going to expand? Well, are the roots and the bone in the upper? Yes. Well, then you can expand the upper jaw. Well, how much can you expand the upper jaw? Uh, the mandible defines that because the buccinator inserts into the mandible. And so the width of that mandible will define how much you can expand the upper jaw. If you violate that just by, for the sake of, you know, airway, then you're going to get in trouble. And a lot of times, I mean, think about it. The maxilla doesn't express um, lack of growth only in the transverse. That would be ridiculous to think that the body only knows how to express um, uh, incorrect growth or deficiency with the transverse uh, invariably. If you have a if you have a maxilla that is transverse deficient, you have a maxilla that's anterior posteriorly deficient, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's just uh, you know that's most of the most of the time. So uh, I think Becca's point is simply, uh, if I if I can say that you know expansion is great, but it is not the only thing, and there comes a time when expansion for expansion's sake is detrimental to the system. Mm -hmm. So. With that in mind, that's a that's a lot of good info right there. I mean, you're basically, you know, coming at this from a standpoint of there's a it sounds like there's a lot of lack of understanding really of of out there about um, you know what we're actually doing when we're expanding and why are we expanding. Um, cool. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, more because I think that that's going to be a lot of people listening to this. They they if there's one thing they've heard about it's expansion, you know, that, that, that's been something that's been, of course, talked about so much. What are some of the, I know you said, obviously every patient is different. We, we know that. And that's kind of the point of the discussion. Um, but what are some of the things that you do look at? You mentioned one, you know, if you've got, you know, roots in bone in the right position, then, you know, maybe we're, for instance, on the maxilla, we've got some ability to expand. Uh, but what are some of the, as you're working through some of those, we threw out the alphabet soup, you know, of, of acronyms, uh, what are some of the ways that you start to step up from, okay, you know, simple, you know, expansion using an appliance in a, in a younger patient to, you know, something involving, uh, you know, MARPI or in other words, in other words, TAD expansion, um, then thinking about, 
Uh, you know, where we go up from there, you know, what are some of the things you're, you're talking about or looking at in, um, say that the patient who we, we know that obviously there's a lot more flexibility in the younger patient, but as patients are maturing, say we're into the older patient who has finished growing, uh, what are some of the ways that you start to determine what types of treatments that, that they might need, how you determine some of the diagnostics there? And I guess maybe start with, let's start with Beck on that and then maybe talk about some of the mechanics of, of that from a surgical standpoint. Great. Yeah. So we have to think about the patient three-dimensionally. So the transverse dimension, that's one dimension. Width is one dimension. If we think about airway, it's nasal passages and then a big tube to simplify things. And so there's a forward back component. And then with the mandible as well, there's a vertical well, and the maxilla, there's a vertical component. And so we have to think about tongue space. We have to think about pharyngeal airway space. And so expansion opens up the base of the nose and it creates more space for the tongue volumetrically. If you have a patient that's mandibular deficient, especially someone that has a vertical issue and they're mandibular deficient, widening the upper jaw doesn't help the pharyngeal airway space because it's a three-dimensional problem. That's a patient that requires counterclockwise rotation to truly open the system. And so it comes down to proper diagnosis. And like Mike said, when we have a narrow maxilla, if we think about it in the context of, of growth and development, think about a child that has nasal respiratory issues, three, four, five years old. That child is breathing with his or, his or her mouth open all the time, tongue is down and back. It's the tongue pushing up and forward that's going to drive the width of the upper jaw and it's going to drive the forward growth of the maxilla and the mandible because it's the tongue pushing up drives the growth of the jaw in the width and in the forward back gets the mandible coming forward. And so now you have a child 7, 10, you have an adult 20, 30, 40, everything has grown down and back. Sometimes there's a vertical component as well. Widening won't get you what you want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So in these adult patients, then, um, you're looking at making those decisions. Obviously it sounds like this vertical, this vertical side of this. And of course, AP is what it sounds like is the most maybe missed. Is that fair? Dr. Gunson, do you think that that's what is just not being talked about as much or, or is not as much knowledge about versus the transverse at this point? I, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, actually to to go back to that faculty uh, or the summit meeting the the lecture that i gave at that meeting was called shut your mouth and save your life and that that title of of the uh the lecture is the title of a book that was published in the late 1800s by an artist and uh this artist uh, traveled uh the united states and drew pictures of uh indian uh, children, Native American Indian uh, children, and and um, and he noted that the uh, the Native American children and adults all slept with their mouths closed, and then he couldn't help but uh, uh, notice that uh, the Europeans all slept with their mouths open, and and then he started noticing all the problems that come along with um, mouth breathing, and uh, and so. Back in the late 1800s, you have this uh, artist um, who identified the detrimental aspects of uh, mouth breathing. So fast forward, in orthodontics and in dentistry, we call it the interlabial gap. Uh, it's the, um, you know, the distance between the lips and repose when the teeth are touching. And really, uh, very few people have made uh, any noise about interlabial gap. Um, Ricketts in a couple of publications in the 60s, uh, Burstone. I mean, these are, you know, classic names in orthodontia and in publications, they, they made some noise, but very little is made about getting the lips together. Now, a lot is made about getting the lips together and mouth breathing, but not a lot is, is uh, discussed diagnostically. What I mean by that is obviously lip tapings become a big deal. I mean, you can go on YouTube and see some fun videos of people taping their lips closed and, and uh, you go to meetings and people are selling lip tape and uh, dentists are prescribing uh, lip tape. But I mean, are we, 
I mean, is, is really the diagnostic problem that there's not enough tape in our lives? I'm being facetious, right? That's not the answer. It's not the lack of tape. The, the issue is the anterior vertical. And the problem is, is the development of that anterior vertical. And to go back to what Becca said, this happens very, very early. Uh, earlier than any of us have been comfortable intervening in kids. Uh, but we need to. Um, we need to figure out means and ways of preventing this anterior vertical growth. But when it starts to happen, the lips separate. And as the lips separate, the brain still does not care that the lips have to travel a distance to get closed. The brain wants the lips closed. So during the day, these kids and even adults make efforts to close their mouths. And this lip pressure against the dental alveolar complex causes eruption of the teeth, compounding the problem, you know, bringing those teeth together or closer together in spite of the vertical dimension increasing. So then what happens is, is you get somebody, a more teenage adult that comes into the office where there's overbite, and yet the anterior vertical length is probably a full centimeter longer than it should be. And this patient has a heck of a time closing their mouths. And we don't talk to patients about this. This is one of the things that was astounding when I read this guy's book. Um, I started asking my patients, I, I would say, um, what's it feel like? I mean, how, what's the problem with you getting your lips together? And they say, oh, I hate it. I spend all day holding my mouth together. And when I'm not paying attention, I drool. And then the, and then the parent looks over at the kid like, what? what? You have a problem closing your mouth? Well, yeah, I have to do it all the time. And then, of course, the part that they don't know about is the part where um, uh, where they go to sleep at night and they end up breathing through their mouths. Um, yeah, it's funny. That's a new cover uh, for the book <laughs> that you pulled up there. Um, but th this is all developmental, and it and it happens over time. It happens very early. And then Becca and I at Spear, and also in the in a course that we're going to give um, in November, we talk about this where um, where once this vertical has taken place, this vertical growth in the anterior, we get all of the aesthetic defects that we see in adults that people hate. The lips get thinner. There are wrinkles around the lips. The orbicularis or muscle gets hypertrophic, so you get this round look to the lips. The mentalis muscle gets hypertrophic, so people get these balled up chins. Um, the nasal, um, the nostrils narrow as the upper lip pulls down. Um, so all of these things that people are spending actually billions of dollars to solve with uh, injections in their lips and uh, um, you know facelifts and all these other things that people do to help uh, solve these problems, they're actually caused by inappropriate vertical growth in the anterior for the most part. So you can see it has wide reaching effects. I haven't even talked about speech. It affects speech and it definitely affects breathing as you know. So yes, I, I don't think, and then to finish, I don't think dentists one know how to measure uh, anterior vertical height. And I don't know that they know what interlabial gap means or where it comes from. Or for example, I know that dentists, uh, aesthetic dentists measure uh, maxillary incisor repose at rest. That's a very important measurement, right? In aesthetics and aesthetic dentistry. But almost as important or more important functionally is lower incisor exposure at rest. And that is something that nobody publishes, nobody talks about. But lower incisor exposure at rest is a manifestation of this lower teeth compensation eruption for too much anterior vertical. So yeah, we need to change the way we talk and the way we look at patients, uh, and that's a good place to start. Wes, I think you're muted. I think the thing that's interesting is, is it a lack, like John said, of understanding, right? And as we kind of finish up the last 15 minutes of our show here, is there a lack of understanding, or is it a combination of the lack of understanding and the way the market is driven today is from a, from a standpoint mm -hmm. of orthodontics. Because, I mean, even, even this week, um, 
there are larger organizations, dentally, DSOs, that have made a huge push into the orthodontic realm. And um, obviously that can be argued whether they should be doing that or not. That's not for, for us to. But the market is driven right now to basically my children need their teeth straightened, right? So I'm going to go to an orthodontist and have their teeth straightened. But as we've changed as a society and Western medicine or Western ways of uh, doing things, how we grow in the Western way of how we develop our children and whether there's a fad now of, you know, nursing or whether it's soft food diets or, you know, how people breathe in different parts of the country that affect the way they grow, you have people that have more and more growth, let's call them deficiencies, right, walking into these orthodontic uh, offices, and I just want my teeth straightened, right? So is the push, is the reason why uh, that we're having a hard time with diagnosis that the community is driving straight my teeth or the market's driving straight my teeth, or is there really a true lack of understanding? Because all of these things, it's interesting to me. Right. In my learning and just a little bit of reading that I've done, you know, these older books from the 1800s and then papers written in the 70s and early 80s, these concepts are not new. It's just that full oh. circle. We're just mm -hmm. now, are we catching up to what they already knew or did we reject because of the market? Right. That's the question yeah. I have. Right. So. I'm going to put both of you on the screen for this. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to briefly touch on how old these topics are. So um, I hope I hope in the near future to have um, this uh, this course with a friend of mine. Uh, he's a restorative dentist, uh, Dr. McClendon, called Everything That I Need to Know in Regards to you know, Dentistry and, and My Practice, I Learned in Removable. And, you know, removable is the course that we hate. I mean, I hated removable when I was in it. But when you stop and you look at every step that you made in removable, that is the precise steps that we need to be making when we treat somebody who has teeth. Just because there's teeth in there doesn't, solve, doesn't remove the functional analysis that we were making. You know, where where does that pink wax go over the ridge? Does your impression actually include the retromolar pad and the maxillary tuberosity? Uh, as far as orthodontists go, no, never, but it should, you know, and I could explain why over the next 10 minutes. But so, yes, it's old and we just need to go back to the basics of diagnosis. And um, but I've already said too much. Becca. <laughs> Um, well, to answer your question about market trends, it is interesting watching what's happening in the world of orthodontics and certainly what's happening in the world of mail order orthodontics, do it yourself orthodontics is kind of taking it to a whole nother level. I mean, it, maybe this is a radical statement, but one could even argue that most crowding, most malocclusions we see maybe are secondary to a tongue or airway issue that has yet to be identified or diagnosed. Uh, and so as an orthodontist, when, when I have a patient in the chair, people come to me because not everyone comes because they have an airway issue. It's a child in the chair that has crowding, narrow maxilla, maybe, maybe some other issues. As soon as I start asking the parents questions about some of the airway things we've talked about, even just going through the Shervin pediatric sleep questionnaire, does your child wake through the night? Are there attention issues at school? Any difficulty with breastfeeding? Have you ever heard them snore? Um, these questions, mm -hmm. was there a difficulty with uh, potty training through the night? No parent has thought to answer those questions to an orthodontist or a dental provider before. And so now we've opened the door for a whole nother discussion. Now orthodontics is about getting their child healthy. Certainly for the adult patient, do you wake up? And I had kids this week with morning headaches. A 13-year-old should not be waking up with headaches every morning. And, and so now, yes, I can straighten your teeth and possibly set you up for a lifetime of sleep and airway health. 
that's transformative. If we're talking about families that are shopping providers, now all of a sudden you have a provider that's talking to them about health and wellness. And yes, the teeth are gonna be straight. Yes, aesthetics is gonna happen along the way. It's a game changer. It, there, there is no competition anymore. And, and now mm -hmm. there's a feel good sense in the whole office. You talk about morale among staff, you talk about mm -hmm. mission and vision in, among team members. We are committed as a practice, we're making people healthy. It's exciting, it's, it, it's a reason to get up in the morning, it's a reason to work hard on your patient's behalf. Uh, and so it's unfortunate that, there's, that there is a trend maybe for just mass orthodontics, but I, I think for any orthodontist that's listening right now to start asking new questions, it's really an opportunity. Wow. Yeah, and I think that that is, we, this is, this is such a, it's so well put because I think that whenever we, Wes and I have talked, I mean, gosh, this is pretty much what the show was based on and founded on was the idea of why isn't this happening? You know, the way that, I mean, we know, um, a better way. And the problem I think is, is that once you know something, you're responsible for it. And so it really is a question of, are you willing to get to know what's, you know, what's possible. And I think the challenge that we're, there is a big challenge, which is implementation, uh, into a practice that's not been doing things that way. Um, and we could spend 10 shows on that discussion, which we, you know, we won't dive too deep into that because, but I think it is the major fear. Um, but the, I think it's unfounded fear that if we do it that way, that we maybe won't be successful from a business standpoint, you can have absolutely both things. You know, in fact, I think it's actually, uh, in my opinion, and Wes and I both have practices that try to be that way, that you can be much more successful, even if that's your focus is business success. If you truly have this holistic view of a patient and because they've never heard that before, but I, I want to maybe ask that a different way. And maybe this is going to, that you know, we're going to be a little controversial here because that's how we are. Um, do you think it's that orthodontists don't know, or do you think that they just don't want to talk about it because it's too difficult of a conversation that they feel like if they say your child's going to need surgery, the fear is that that patient will go to a different orthodontist and get a different story. And or maybe even, even from a surgical community. Yeah, exactly. You know, and maybe in the community, I think, John, we've heard the, get the word, reputation. Yeah, the reputation. This is fad dentistry. Yeah, or right? aggressive or I mean, something I've, along those lines. I've been told that I'm practicing fad dentistry, right? I mean, yeah. right now. This conversation is a fad, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a resistance to it. And if you're an orthodontist and you're called out, right, right. in your community, like that guy's what he's, right? Well, yeah, I, I think I think uh, I think it, if you call yourself an airway dentist, then there might be some truth to being called a fad dentist. But if you if you call yourself a you know a dentist who is interested in airway and function and bite and aesthetics and you know this like you said a holistic approach, and unfortunately that word is you know yeah. not a friendly word for most people, right? But holistic as in W-H-O-L-E. I mean, that's like, mm -hmm. that's the word, right? Um, but absolutely, to answer your question, it's all of the above. There are orthodontists that don't know those things because they're not trained that way in their orthodontic programs to think about functions. They're, uh, so they're not trained, and then they come out, and then they're put into these, um, you know, uh, orthodontic mills, and um, they have to produce, and so there's no time really to to get to the diagnosis other than to straighten the teeth. So th there are those. Then there are those that know, but you are correct. They, uh, you know, here's the option. Um, I can straighten your teeth and put your teeth together. I'll send you to my friend and he'll break your face and put you back together. And, uh, and then that might help too, you know, or, and it's really amazing um, the amount I have these orthodontists, uh, friends of mine that say, oh, Mike, I, I really wish I could get more patients to go to you. And I'm like, well, you know, that's not my problem, nor the surgical, you know, the surgery's problem. That's your problem because you can't explain it well, you know. So, I mean, honestly, if you if you explain it to a patient and you identify with them and their functional deficiencies and the problems that they experience day to day, 
if you if you connect with them on that level they'll be like yeah i i have to do that because i have to stop feeling this way and you've understood me where other people have not yes now yes. there will be those patients there will be those patients who are like yeah i don't want to do that and that's fine great go back exactly. and in fact fine. i don't care i don't care to treat or actually like force them to believe in their dysfunction that's the worst thing that you can do as a clinician is try to try to force a patient to understand their dif dysfunction or to pay attention to it when they don't want to you don't want to get involved in that that's bad news yeah. so now i and, and i'll underline what becca said i have to underline it when the practice changes to that you as a dentist are benefited by it but i want to underline what she said the staff open up mm. because they mm -hmm. just they love talking to patients now they love providing this health care being part of this overall like the feeling changes in the office that this happened in my practice probably yeah. about over, a little over 10 years ago when we moved into uh, functional growth discussions with patients and my staff completely changed and i got i swear i got another 10 years out of them you know and they're still with me uh, I think otherwise they might have just burned out with just the, oh, your face is here and here and we need to move things here and here. Mm, Passionate yeah. about that. Now, what do you think, you know, because I feel like you guys are, are I mean, it's why you're doing what you're doing. You're, you're raging against the machine, if you will, of what's unfortunately like there's some things that have happened that are, are happening that are making this more challenging in certain ways. But then there's also, of course, bright spots with people that are, you know, learning more. And even if all they know is the basics about appliances, even if that's what they start with, you know, with mandibular advancement appliances, you know, that's a start to get them at least in the world of understanding there's some things they need to learn. And I think that the the surgical community, though, I want to be asked that question from Dr. Gunson about the surgeons, because I, the orthodontists have a particular set of, of challenges that they're facing with, you know, how they want how they want to handle referrals. I mean, again, we could dive into the super deep. I'm not gonna, but just thinking, okay, yeah. if you are an orthodontist who talks about, you know, airway and surgery and you're referring dentists have no clue about that. That's also a huge hurdle, right? Of, of how that referral based relationship is, is going to be handled. The surgical yeah. side is different. It seems to me because if they're ending up in your office, it's because someone has recommended that they see you to discuss surgery. So there's a little bit different relationship that happens there. So what do you, what's the reason why we don't see as much orthognathic surgery being done? Uh, and I think I know some of the answers to this, but I want to hear your thoughts on that from a surgeon standpoint. Why, why is it a lot of surgical uh, specialists are not offering that or, or not doing that? Or is it, is it a lack of experience? Is it lack of training? Is it lack of reimbursement? You know, what are some of the factors that are playing a role in this? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's really all the above. So I'll, I'll start at the bottom and kind of work my way up from there. And I don't mean the bottom when I refer to orthodontists, but I, I, <laughs> that's where it starts usually is, is, and I brought it up already. It's the description number one of, of what's going to happen to the patient. So there's a bit of bias in saying, well, um, you know, you, you're going to get your face broken. And the other topic too, is you'll get your face broken and it'll cost a lot of money. Um, and so the other bias that comes in, which is, um, uh, justified is that orthognathic surgery is extremely difficult. It, it has um, a reputation amongst most, ortho, most orthodontists as not being accurate. And uh, orthodontists, I don't know if I would say rarely, but often don't get back what they expect to get back. And so it's a headache. And think about it. An orthodontist makes a referral to a surgeon. The surgeon does the surgery. The surgery goes back to the orthodontist. And let's say that the bite doesn't fit together correctly because the surgery wasn't done accurately. Well, who's holding the bag right now? The orthodontist, not the surgeon, because even if the orthodontist says to the patient, well, the surgery wasn't performed accurately, now I have to fix this. In the end, the patient looks at the orthodontist and says, well, yeah, but you sent me to that surgeon, mm -hmm. right? So the orthodontist position is really untenable, uh, given that the orthodontic surgery is not 
as accurate as it should be. If you delve into the literature, for example, midline discrepancies in the mandible to what, you know, moving the jaw where you plan to move it, uh, lateral discrepancies of the midline on average are two millimeters, which is completely visible. And, uh, and that's the average from most published studies. And if, if my inaccuracies were two millimeters average, I would, I would hang it up. I'd stop, you know, because I, I couldn't tolerate not getting predictable results. So there's that level. Then, then there's the level of the surgery. So just like um, orthodontists, the surgeons, when they see a case, oftentimes the surgeon's default is I need to minimize what I'm doing. I need to minimize. So I need to find a way, for example, to just keep this in the lower jaw. You know, I don't want to operate the upper jaw. I just need to do one jaw. So now the the oral surgeon is making requests of the orthodontist to move teeth in a very compensatory way in order to keep it into one jaw. Then the result is not as good as you'd expect, both aesthetically as well as functionally. Then the next step, well, I'll do both jaws, but I don't want to do segment, seg segmental upper jaw surgery. So I'm going to have the orthodontist do the dental expansion instead of me doing the uh, bony expansion. And this is very common, especially in Europe, to not do multi-segment maxillary surgery. Well, now you're setting yourself up for relapse with the dental expansion as well as recession, uh, root uh, loss, uh, bone loss, etc. And so what you get back is, is a less than stellar uh, result again. Then you add to the mix things like condylar resorption, joint arthritis, um, connective tissue disorders, pain patients. Um, and all of a sudden it's like, uh, you know what, orthognathic surgery, it's just, um, it's a pain. And, and then you talk about reimbursement. So Blue Cross reimbursement for a surgeon. So when you think about the surgery, it's anywhere from, you know, two to six hours of surgery. Um, the, the amount of follow-up that's needed, the risks that are involved, um, and Blue Cross is going to pay this surgeon $2,000. Hmm. So would you rather take out four wisdom teeth at uh, somewhere between two and $4,000, or would you rather spend all this time doing jaw surgery and get $2,000? No. Unfortunately, the way around this is to, is to not, you know, personally, uh, my patients understand that I can't give them the result that they desire at $2,000 of surgery. Um, so yeah, they have to pay um, more. Um, but see, what, what underlines this entire discussion is these decisions are made by us as practitioners. Yes. We can either going forward become mechanics in a garage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or we can become physicians and healers, you know, yes. it's one or the other. And, uh, and I think there's room for both in society, not that, you know, I, I've chosen to be a healer. That's what I want to be. Uh, right. but if you want to be a mechanic, that's fine. I think that explains like people's practice to the T, right? Is that mm -hmm. you, you, you have a subset of patients that are emergent. Right. And we talk about this in our new patient orientation in our office is that what type of patient is this? Are they emergent patient? Are they reactive? You know, or maybe they're insurance driven. Right. Maybe they're maybe they're regenerative. We have that term in our office. Maybe they want to regenerate, replace what was lost, per se. And maybe mm -hmm. they want to be even the top echelon, which is elective. Right. And we have this discussion all the time. My tr treatment planning coordinator, it's the opt out of benefits discussion. And it happens continually. Mm -hmm. If you oh, yeah. want our office to do the best job possible, right, and perform our mission statement, right, and then you're going to need <clears throat> to opt out of benefits for the doctors and our team to be able to perform this procedure. And I think that's that's what we've chosen to do, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. and I and I tell my associate as he's learning what type of dentistry he wants to practice, and, and he's gotten more passionate about so many facets. I'm like, slow down just a little bit, and like, and you'll see things over here on the Instagram, the Facebook, the YouTube, and you'll say, well, look at what they're doing, right? But wait, mm. back up just a minute, right? How do you want to treat your patients 
Yeah. Right. And I think and too on that on that same line, you know, with what we're talking about, you know, it, obviously this brings us to a point of saying, okay, so there's a certain number of people who are just going to look at this and say it's too much work. I don't want to implement this. It's you know I'm just going to put my head in the sand and you know those as as we've heard before, you, know, you can't help everybody. But for the practitioner, whether it be uh, a general dentist, whether it, that, that's wanting to have a team, whether it's a surgeon or an orthodontist who wants to get out of that mold and become a healer or get better at this, let's talk as we kind of close the show about, well, how can they, where do they go? And, and of course, this is a plug for you guys because you're doing this, but it's not just because of that. It's that I don't think there are a lot of places they can go. And so let's talk about that. What are you guys teaching? Um, is it, is, are you teaching courses for surgeons, for orthodontists, for restorative dentists? You know, what, what's kind of, what, what would you tell somebody, where do they need to start and how do they get uh, connected with what you guys are doing? Becca. Uh, so I, I think Mike and I are both pretty passionate about pattern recognition. And so if, if you really want to understand the spectrum from growth and development all the way to the needs uh, as far as it goes as jaw surgery that's what we're trying to teach and we teach that at spear education we're trying to teach that in the in the our new course that we're putting together it's a three-day course that's going to be held in seattle and it's really going to dive into all the things that we talked about why do we see some of the skeletal patterns that we see why do we see open bites cross bites under bites over bites how do we handle this how do we handle it in a child? How, how do we handle it in an adult? How do we understand dysfunction? Um, because, at, and it's really meant for an interdisciplinary team. It's meant for a general dentist. It's meant for a pediatric dentist, a periodontist, an oral surgeon, an orthodontist. Uh, and I think any, any time the two of us have a chance to teach, we're, we're really teaching to a broader audience. Now, what about Gunnison, talk a little bit about yeah. talk a little bit about this course that you guys are putting on healthy yeah. growth, healthy faces. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time, and I throwed up the uh, put up the uh, um, the image of the course and what's going to be taught there. If you're on YouTube, you can check that out. And I know it's going to be taught in November 11th through the 13th. But tell us a little bit about this course. Uh, because we're super pumped. This is what we've been asking for for a long time. Mm -hmm, so tell us mm -hmm. what what's what's behind this. Um, so we just uh, Beck and I both felt like. Um, uh, let me back up just a little bit. So I, there came a time in my career where I felt like um, I was better off talking to uh, uh, dentists than I was uh, surgeons, um, mostly because that's that's who sees people, you know, that's who identifies the functional and developmental problems. And as I as I did, I found that I had a lot to share um, for the general dentist, uh, how to identify problems, uh, both aesthetic and functional in, in these groups. And so uh, Beck and I needed a, a means of, of covering like the human experience from birth until you know later in life in regards to first growth and development um, very young ages uh, analyzing what to look for when somebody comes into your office uh, what are the things that i can do how can i refer what what should i expect uh, what do i get back um, and then moving into the teen years and the and the adult years well, what are the compensations? How does the face decline? Um, you know, uh, how do I identify facial decline? How is that infecting my dentistry? You know, if I am, am I going to be, um, am I going to make a mistake in following uh, norms, you know, normal aspects, things that I've been taught are normal? Will I make mistakes because of the existence of compensations? Or can I actually correct things to a healthy position instead of a normal position and get a better result. And so it just, we, Becca's strengths in regards to early intervention and early diagnosis, and then my observations in adults of compensation, pathology, breakdown of the face, the teeth, and the bones, it just, it's a continuum. 
And then, so to have a course on one without the other, it, it wasn't sitting well. So to put it all together, I think it helps the dentist entire practice, an orthodontist entire practice. So I think that's what, that's what I felt. That's why I wanted to, to do the course, Becca. Yeah, same. Yeah. Well, I think that's the pathway that, um, you know, both as restorative dentists, I think that all of us are, are in the same boat that are, uh, have been going through this world of, you know, starting with facially generated treatment planning, for instance, or if we just started from what we said at the last show, just because people or patients are breaking our stuff and we want to figure out what's going on with their airway, you know, and, and maybe it starts at different points from restorative dentists, maybe from a surgeon, it starts from, Hey, we, you know, I had some of this training. It's something I really am, you know, want uh, to change the way my practice looks. I want to get more involved with this. Maybe it's an orthodontist who is deciding to create that more, you know, holistic with a WH, like you said, uh, type of practice. You know, this is the type of course that you can get a team together and really start learning what it takes to understand this and uh, and potentially implement this. And obviously, there's a lot more to this. This is where we think, you know, the idea of the study club really uh, is the key, you know, having a group of people that you can sit down with and talk about these cases and how do they fit into the, the rubric or the diagnostic. I mean, I'm sure that's what you guys do all the time, whether it's just a, together or with a small group of people that you, that you trust. But I think this is going to allow you to be too around passionate people that are all in the same boat. And I think that the networking that happens at these courses, that's why we're so excited about live courses being back because the courses... Mm -hmm the centerpiece, but in a, in an area like we're talking about, um, there's, it's being around the people who have that knowledge and are learning together. I think that's almost as important as the actual information. So, you know, if you haven't uh, checked out what uh, these two are doing, both at Spear and through this course coming up in Seattle, definitely go check it out. Uh, we'll have links in the show notes too. Uh, where you can go find out more and register for uh, for these upcoming courses, and uh, we uh, we didn't even get close to all the questions that we wanted to to ask about some of the other sides of the more of the mechanical side of orthognathic surgery. Um, so we'd love to talk more at some point and kind of go down that road a little further about more specifics on surgery and kind of how that interfaces with orthodontics. I mean some of the questions we get asked all the time about recovery time and does yeah. my jaw have to be wired shut and how do you determine mm -hmm. that and you know what what's mm -hmm. changed in the surgical approaches and what's the most modern way to do it and then how does the orthodontist you know determine what's going to need to be treated with upper and lower jaw or both and so there's a lot more to this but i think it's been a great uh start to a great conversation and so we really appreciate you guys being with us uh today it's been it's been a lot of fun so thanks guys. Um, we, uh, if, if this show has been beneficial to you and your practice, uh, if you've learned something today, if it's challenged your thought process on, uh, any of these topics, which I'm sure it has, uh, we want to hear from you. And one of the best ways you can tell us that, uh, you benefited from this is to give us a five-star review on Apple podcast. That's huge for us. It, it's how people find out about us uh, and what we're doing. Uh, so go leave us, leave us a great review. Shame on you if you haven't, if you've been listening for all this time. Come on, get on it. Social media, we are on all the socials uh, and uh, we are continuously updating uh, with new episodes, new content. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming up in the coming months, including potentially more with these folks. Um, so connect with us on the social media outlets. Tell us what you want to hear more about. Tell us what you thought about today's show. Uh, and, uh, always, you know, we look, we are, we will listen to ideas for upcoming shows. Um, it's been another, uh, fun time. Thanks for spending your, uh, you know, your hour or so with us. Uh, it's always great to get to grow together uh, and learn together with our listeners. So for Dr. Rebecca Bacow, Dr. Michael Gunson, the West and John, we are the dental guys. Mm -hmm.